Hey everybody, Dr. Retzek here with you. This is our final video in section 7c. We are in the middle of characterizing isometries. Let's get started. So I've pulled up what we had last time. We have this theorem, 7.42 in the book. And it's telling us all these things that are equivalent to being an isometry. So we're in the middle of our proof. And so far we've proven that if S is an isometry, then B holds. If B holds, then C holds. If C holds, then D holds. And we're in the middle of proving that if D holds, E holds. So we're assuming there exists an orthonormal basis E1 through EN such that SE1 through SEN is also orthonormal. And we're trying to argue that S star S equals I. So I'm going to scroll to that part of the proof where we're doing D implies E. Okay. So suppose E1 through EN is an orthonormal basis for V, <clears throat> such that SE1 through SEN is also orthonormal. And we've observed this equality, if you do S star S to EJ, inner product EK, that's the same as EJ, inner product EK. So it kind of looks like at this moment, right here, and here, it gives us some sort of hope that maybe S star S really is the identity. That certainly doesn't prove it. And your author and most books would go on to say something like, at this moment, they'd say, well, and since we have this equality for all the orthonormal basis vectors, uh, then we have it for any two vectors. And they kind of just leave it at that. I want to make sure we're clear how to make the leap from this equality, which is definitely true concerning the ease, to the bigger statement. So here's what we want to say right now. We want to say this, and Axler just does. Want to say, oh, sweet. So since it's true for basis vectors, then this is true for all vectors in our space. That's what we'd like to say. Now, the justification for being able to say that, it is true. The justification is any two such vectors, u and v, can be written as linear combinations of the e's. So let's say u is a1, e1, plus dot, 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 all the way through a n, e n. And similarly, V is B1E1 plus dot, 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 all the way through BNEN. Then if we were interested in how S star S acting on U inner products with V, we could just gut it out and just expand everything, use additivity, linearity, all these things, by seeing what S star S does to the combination A1, E1 plus dot, 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 A, N, E, N, inner product of the combination B1, E1 plus dot, 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 B, N, E, N. Now, you could just mega foil that out because you have additivity in both slots. And eventually, it would boil down to S star S acting on the E's inner product with the E's. So you could use this fact here, use this one once you break that thing down into all its constituent pieces. I think there's like, n squared different terms if you mega foil that. 
And if you do, then in the end, it's going to come down to this. A1, E1 plus dot, 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 A, N, E, N, inner product, B1, E1 plus dot, 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 B, N, E, N, which is just U, V. And that's what Axler is asking us to believe. All that dot, dot, dot with the megafoil is what he's asking us to believe to establish the thing we want to say. S star S U inner product V is the same as U inner product V. Okay, so now let's suppose we believe that. So now, now we're done. That's the end of the proof. You guys can check out that dot, dot, dot if you care to. But that's what's happening when they ask us to believe stuff like that. So right now at this moment, in D implies E, we're here. S star S acting on U inner product V is the same as U inner product V. And that's true for all U and V. And that's key for us, that that's true for all U and V. So we know this then. Uh, S star S U take away U inner product V is zero for all u and v. So that's just additivity in the first slot. Subtract the right-hand side over to the left-hand side. Okay, so in particular, if that's true for all u and v, then it's true when v is the thing in the first slot. So s star s u take away u inner product s star s u take away u is zero and that's true for all u so s star s u take away u is zero for all u Zero the number, zero the vector. So finally, S star S acting on U is U for all U in the space. Thus, S star S is equal to the identity. Okay. So there's a couple things going on there in D implies E that I think happen really quickly in the proof in the book, but they have a little bit of substance to them. First thing is you try to take your understanding of how S star S is behaving and interproducting with these orthonormal basis vectors and extend that to an understanding of how it's acting on and interproducting with any vectors U and V. And once you establish that, that proves in particular that S star S acting on U has to be U. Okay. All right, here we go. Let's scroll back up. What are we even doing? Uh, that was D implies E. Where's the actual statement? Now we have to do E implies F. All right, here we go. E implies F. Okay. E implies F. So here we get to assume that S star S equals the identity. Okay, so here's what's key about that. <clears throat> if S star S equals the identity, well, S and S star are both one to one and onto. After all, S has to be one to one because if S took any non-zero input and sent it to zero, then so would S star S and I doesn't do that. Okay, so S is definitely one to one. And if S star were somehow not onto, well, then the composition of S star and S couldn't be onto 
S star would miss somebody, and I doesn't miss anybody in its range. So for sure, if S star S is equal to I, S is one to one, and S star is on two. But this is a finite dimensional vector space, and so the fundamental theorem of linear maps says one to one and on two if and only if either one of them. So S star and S are both one to one and on two, so they're invertible is the point. And since they're invertible, you could multiply both sides on the right by S inverse. And then on the left by S star inverse. And you would get the, the identity is S star inverse, S inverse. Uh, which is SS star, all inverse. So SS star must be the identity. So we've gone from knowing that S star S is the identity to knowing that SS star is the identity. Perfect. Okay. Now we got to do F implies g. Okay, let's figure this out. Let's scroll up. What are we doing? Now we have to argue that s star is an isometry. So now the whole thing started with s an isometry, and we're going to argue that s star is an isometry. So we know the definition to argue that s star is an isometry. We're going to assume f, so assume ss star is the identity. And now to argue that s star is an isometry, let's look at the square of the norm of s star v. We're trying to argue that the norm of s star v is the same as the norm of v. Okay, well, let's write this out in inner product land. That's just S star V inner product itself. All right. Swing that S star over into the first slot as an S. But we're assuming S S star is the identity. done. So truly, the norm of S star V matches the norm of V. So that's great. Therefore, S star is an isometry in its own right. Okay, let's go for G implies H. Okay, G implies H. All right, so assume S star is an isometry. Okay. If we're going to assume that S star is an isometry, and we've already proven these two things, are true when S is an isometry, then the version of those two things where S is replaced by S star is true when S star is an isometry. So A implies E and F when S is an isometry. So S star an isometry implies E and F with the role of S being played by S star. And since S star star is, star is S, we also get these versions. So if S star is an isometry, we get these two things by the work we've already done in this proof.
they follow because S star is an isometry. But these two things say that S is invertible and S inverse is S star. So let's write that out like this so we have some words to go with this section of the proof. Uh, then E and F hold for S star. In other words, S S star is the identity and S star S is the identity. Thus, S is invertible and S inverse is its adjoint. So that's nice. <clears throat> Isometries are invertible. And to find the inverse of an isometry, you simply take the adjoint. Okay, so let's, let's regroup. Where are we in this long process? Okay, here we go. We have done A implies B implies C implies D implies E implies F implies G implies H. Now, we're going to come full circle and argue that if you knew S was invertible and equal and its inverse was equal to its adjoint, that would force S to be an isometry. So now we're going to do H implies A. So this is our last move. H implies A. So on this one, assume S is invertible and its inverse is S star. We're trying to argue that S has to be an isometry in that case. Okay, well, again, we know the definition of isometry, so let's see how SV looks. Okay, norm SV squared. Okay, well, that's SV with SV. Which, by definition of adjoint, is V S star S V. We are assuming that S star is S inverse, so S star S is the identity. So this right here is just I. So we have V inner product itself, which is norm V squared. Therefore, all of these things are equivalent because they each imply one another. So the big proof is done. We have lots of things now that being an isometry is equivalent to. The last result in this section, you guys can read it. At the start of the section, we said, hey, if you're looking to build isometries, then Find orthonormal bases of eigenvectors where the eigenvalues are all magnitude 1. So that's how you can build an isometry. Send each thing in an orthonormal set, ej, to lambda j, ej, where lambda j has absolute value 1. In the case of complex inner product spaces, that street runs both ways. So not only do you get an isometry when you build something that way, anything that's an isometry is built in that way. Not true for real vector spaces, but at least for complex, uh, to be an isometry is equivalent to possessing an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors where the eigenvalues are all absolute value one. Anyway, that's the last result. It follows from complex spectral theorem and what we just proved. Okay, that is it for 7C. The stage is set. We are ready to move to 7D and prove our big characterization theorem for any operator on an inner product space V. All right, see you next time. Bye.